Hello there YouTube, Devin here again. Uh, it is Saturday morning, so before I go to work and shower and everything after my run and uh, all of my exercising and stuff, you know, gotta, gotta stay in shape and all the other cool jazz, because uh, you know, the end of the world's coming up here pretty soon, uh, for those of you who don't understand, uh, or know, that's a joke, it probably won't actually end, but it'll get pretty rough here probably sometime in the near future. Um, but before all that life happens, um, we're going to talk more about helmets. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is actually one of the kind of weirder helmets I own. Um, and this one's got a couple little things wrong with it, uh, but it still functions normal. It's just, uh, it's got the, the liners a little bit different than it should be. Uh, this is an STSH-81. Um, the STSH-81 is a Russian helmet uh, with Soviet origins. Um, so back in the 80s, um, Russia was having a lot of trouble with developing a lot of stuff. Uh, back in the day, they, uh, Russia is, uh, has very, actually, very few iron deposits. And by that I mean they have very few pure iron deposits, uh, which means it's very hard for them to make steel. Um, they have a lot of problems getting a lot of the stuff you actually need to make good quality steel. So they would reserve what they could make for, for steel for obviously weapons production and tank production and um, ship production and stuff, you know, the things that you really can't build any of those other things out of. Um, but one thing that Russia does have is basically the vast majority of the world's titanium supply. Um, it's like a ludicrous amount. They have like over 80% of the world's titanium. Um, so what what Russia started to do basically during the Cold War, and this goes all the way back to the 50s even, was start making things that used to be made out of steel for the military out of titanium. Um, they would make body armor out of titanium. They would make helmets out of titanium. They would make silverware out of out of titanium. Uh, plates and stuff were made out of titanium. They would make lots of things for the military out of titanium uh, because Obviously, the government controlled the military, the government controlled a lot of the titanium mines and a lot of the steel production and everything like that, the, the vast majority of it. So they would take as much steel as they could and use that for ship production, tank production, rifle production, stuff like that. And they would use stuff that really wasn't going to be worn out or not as super necessary or really didn't matter what it was made out of, such as, you know, silverware and plates, and make those out of titanium. Um, so this is... One of the byproducts of that, this is a titanium helmet, the STSH-81, otherwise known as the Sphera, uh, because it kind of looks like a sphere, um, and this has the, the flora cover on it, but the cover just pulls off, and this is what the helmet looks like. The entirety of the helmet is a basically series of pouches with pads uh, sewn onto them, so it's all one piece and then there's three pouches there's two on either side and this one kind of big c-shaped over the top that holds titanium plates um so these titanium plates uh were meant to offer a lot of protection and these were given not really to military units uh per se although you do see a lot of russian marines or you know naval infantry wearing this uh but the marines got a lot of weird stuff and they have kind of really crappy procurement, and they get a lot of leftovers and overruns uh, from contracts and other stuff like that, which is why they're a really, really interesting part of the, the Soviet and Russian military to look at, because they have just a smattering of gear from, like, every branch, depending on what era you, you find, and they just have tons of weird stuff that you don't see on any other Russian units, really. Um, so... But this was designed for the Ministry of the Interior, actually, so police forces, uh, stuff like that, uh, would be wearing like this, secret police, um, um, SWAT teams, thing, things of that nature uh, would be wearing stuff like this. And it's made by out of three uh, titanium plates, which I'll, I'll show you. I'm not going to take this whole thing apart because it is a, I'll show you, it's a ludicrous pain to get back together and adjust to make sure it fits right and everything like that. Because this helmet has like a huge amount of flex in it as you can see because there's really nothing holding it together other than this cover so it's a pain to adjust to get it to where it will fit 
comfortably. Um, but this cover is actually a later cover. Um, so in 1994, um, the Russians stopped having a bunch of steel problems. Obviously, the Soviet Union basically collapsed in 1994 uh, fully, and steel production came back. They were able to get a lot of the stuff to, to make steel again, so they would upgrade this helmet. It would be the same exact kind of shape and everything, same hardware and all that stuff, but it would be made with steel plates rather than titanium plates now. Now, contrary to popular belief, titanium isn't all that great at being body armor uh, because titanium is quite brittle. It's strong, but it's brittle. Um, so that's why you don't see people make knives out of it. You don't see a lot of body armor made out of it. You don't, you don't see a lot of stuff because the one thing titanium has going for it is that it's very light. And it's hard to make titanium alloys. Titanium doesn't like to bond with other uh, elements all that well. So it's very hard to make a good body armor out of titanium. Um, because titanium, like I said, it's just a very, it's a strong, but it's a brittle metal. Uh, so it doesn't do super well with tiny, very fast moving, hard impacts such as bullets and shrapnel and stuff like that. And it tends to, to kind of crack or, or shatter the, the titanium. So steel is much better for making body armor and stuff like that because steel can be made very strong, but very soft, which means it has give and bex, uh, bend to it. It'll stretch a little bit. It'll deform rather than just crack you know, or, or, or punch a nice neat hole through, um, you know, you could see a lot of times like these kind of weird cookie cutter cutouts in titanium body armor where a bullet would hit it or a piece of shrapnel, e much bigger than where the actual impact was because that's just where the, the stress points of the metal are, the, the layers and stuff like that, and it would crack along these kind of surfaces. So, um, 1994, the SSH-94 would replace this. So, STSH-81 would be the one with the titanium plates, which is this one, and then the SSSH-94 would be basically this exact same helmet, but with steel. Now, this one's weird, I'm going to tell you, because this has titanium plates in an SSH, SSSH-94 cover. Um, most of the titanium ones you would see uh, would be in this kind of weird kind of green or tan colored cover, and then a lot of the SSH-94s you'd see in a green or a black cover like this. So um, the covers are made out of nylon, as you can see. Uh, the straps are made out of nylon, has a chin cup, and it has an adjustable buckle over here. So um, without further ado here now, uh, we're going to switch the camera angle around. I'm going to show you a closer look on the inside of this helmet. Um, we're kind of take it apart partially and let you see what the, the, the plates kind of look like and everything like that. And then we'll come back and conclude the video and you'll get to see me wear it and see how it performs and see what I really, really like about it and stuff like that. So stay. Alrighty. So as you see here, now we're looking at the inside of the STSH-81. I did have to make a little repair right here. There was a tear. Um, this helmet is actually surprisingly, well, albeit heavy, um, and kind of warm, a very comfortable helmet to wear. It's basically just a series of like foam panels with a nice soft kind of cotton uh, cover over it, and it, it works really well. It's got ear cutouts, as you can see, um, for, for everything there. Uh, you really can't wear comms with this helmet, um, and it does really, really obstruct your hearing and everything like that. And like I said, it does get kind of warm. Um, the STSH-81 uh, is... Uh, Russian, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, it's it's G-O-S-T rating 1, the STSH-81 is, and um, which I think is the lower rating, and then G-O-S-T 2 is the SSH-94, uh, which is the, the steel one. So, steel one is heavier, offers more protection, the titanium one is lighter, offers slightly less protection, they're both incredibly heavy helmets. Um, and everything like that. But as you can see, it's a, got a chin cup. It's actually quite well balanced um, because of how this kind of fork in the chin strap goes all the way over the helmet. So it, it supports quite well. The foam pads hold your head quite well and uh, everything like that. Um, so it's, it's a surprisingly comfortable helmet for what it is, albeit kind of a weird design where it's heavy and bulky. Now I'm going to show you why we're not going to take this whole thing all the way apart. Um, because it's a pain to adjust. As you can see here, it has 
this whole complicated lacing system that goes all the way from the front up here to the back that you have to lace just right and just tight uh, in order to hold all three plates in. So how you would assemble this helmet is you'd get the cover and there's a plate over here, a round kind of dish typed plate with uh, the kind of front cut off, as you can see right here, uh, to not obstruct your view. But other than that, it's pretty round. And on both sides, you would slide those plates in and then you have this big kind of C type or bow shaped plate, as you can see here, that goes all the way around. Uh, that would go over the top of those and would be laced in place to hold everything together. Um, so as you can see, this is indeed the titanium version. Um, so it's made out of uh, those two side plates, like I said, which are stamped, dish shaped, and then cut. And then these two half kind of shapes uh, that have a rivet, uh, riveted bar here in the middle. And that helps to give, give this kind of some flex. You might be able to see it, uh, but it, it keeps it uh, the manufacturing easier. Titanium is not a very heavy, uh, a very easy metal to work with. Uh, the Russians and the Swiss are arguably the best in the world at working with titanium because they have the most experience with it. Um, but it's easier to manufacture two smaller pieces and rivet them together rather than just having this all be one big seamless piece. So, but it's a pretty interesting design. And it works quite well, and it's actually still in use. Both the titanium and the steel version of this helmet are still currently in use at the Ministry of the Interior. Um, you don't see them too often anymore. I think they're pretty much sitting in armory. They've been replaced by a lot better designs, but these do have quite high um, protection levels for what they are. Um, and uh, I'm told that they, they work a lot better in the winter because they trap heat so well and everything like that. Uh, but this is all subject to uh, interpretation and stuff like that. I'm just going based off of what people in Russia have told me, people who have had experience with these helmets. Uh, all of this is obviously subject to uh, scrutiny and all that other good stuff. I could be messing those facts up too with the Russian protection levels. I'm not quite sure what their body armor rating actually means. If the lower number means better, or the higher number means better, or uh, or what. But um, so uh, something I, I need to to read up on. Um, but unfortunately, I do not read Cyrillic really well, and I do not speak all that much Russian or read all that much Russian. So it'd be good to sit down with somebody who really knows a lot about this stuff and actually like get to talk to them about it. Um, but it's a pretty interesting design, as you can see. It's all basically one piece. It's a kind of fluid. It's a very flexible design, which is actually really good in helping it defeat threats. Uh, it will kind of shift and move rather than just trying to brunt, you know, brute force its way into stopping something. It has some give to it and it has some adjustment and uh, that actually helps its protection level. It wasn't intended to be that way, but it, it works out that way in hindsight. So we will now uh, flip the camera back around and take a look at what it looks like being worn and kind of how it fits and all that other good stuff and then we'll conclude the video. Alrighty, so I hope you guys learned something about this video and all that other cool stuff like that. Um, it's, a, it's a more interesting helmet. I wish it had a more kind of rich storied history. It wasn't used for all that long. It was used in very limited numbers, but it's a very cool design. A lot of people haven't seen. I'm really, really glad I added it to my Russian helmet collection, which is probably one of the largest helmet collections I actually have. It's kind of my Russian Soviet collection. And I have a lot of the I don't have a lot of the common ones. I don't own an SSH 68. I don't own an SSH 60. I don't own an SSH 40 even. Uh, but I have a lot of the really kind of rarer, stranger, odder Russian helmets. So, um, but I'll show you how this is, uh, how this looks being worn now. Um, so as you can see here, it has a very distinctive front and back. This little kind of cutout indicates that, that is the front. Um, so other than that, it would be very easy to get kind of confused as to what the front and back would be. And uh, you can adjust this buckle. There's no like quick release or anything on it. So I just have it adjusted and this helmet flexes so much to where you can just kind of slide it on. So now do you see why they call it the... God, this really does block your hearing. You see why they call it the, the Sphera helmet, obviously. Um, it is quite round and bulbous. And, uh, but it's actually quite comfortable. It holds your head very well. It's quite, quite stable. You don't have to really worry about it falling off your head. It doesn't shift around a lot. Um, even though this chin strap is quite loose, it has a lot of play in it. But that just has something to do with the liner and the flexibility of this helmet. This helmet is so weird because it doesn't 
feel like it's stable on your head, but it is. It is very stable on your head. It distributes the weight really, really well. It holds your head quite well. It does block your hearing something fierce, though. And um, But it's, it's warm, it's comfortable, uh, and it, it works quite well, from what I understand, at defeating quite a lot of threats, albeit while looking uh, a bit goofy. Um, so now I'm going to do the, the ro rotate around, and I'm sorry I have my camera just to get. I'm going to have to slouch a little bit. Um, but I'm going to have to uh, show you guys uh, how this all looks. So uh, it's, uh, hopefully it kind of works. I'm going to tell you when we get to the back where I do the thing where uh, I simulate going prone. Kind of a problem with this helmet. Um, but we will get to that when we get there. Um, so this is what it looks like from the front, obviously, without its cover on. It doesn't look as dopey with the cover. Um, so, And then here is it from the side. Here's it from the rear. Um, now the problem with this helmet is because this plate sticks down uh, quite far in order to cover the back of your head, when you look up, it, it bites into your neck quite bad. This helmet uh, bites rather bad, um, but it's not to the point where it like hurts bad, but it, it makes it uncomfortable. It doesn't quite push the helmet forward, um, but you definitely know it's there. So it's uh, probably not ideal if you're wearing body armor, um, but just sitting here wearing, obviously, a t-shirt, it doesn't, it doesn't interfere too bad, but wearing body armor, it would, it would tend to want to shift quite a lot on your head. Um, so, uh, but hopefully, hopefully you enjoyed this video. As you can see, it's quite easy to get on and off. It's a very comfortable helmet. Um, they did make covers for these. Uh, the SSH-81, STSH-81, sorry. Uh, would get a Flora and a VSR cover, and the SSSH-94 would get a wide multitude of covers, including these uh, VSR and Flora covers. So, uh, and they're pretty easy to attach, they just slide right over. There's nothing holding them in place other than two little straps of elastic here at the, the back and the front, um, but that's what they would they would look like. And uh, so now I'll throw it back on here so you can see what it looks like with the cover. And you can see it doesn't look, it doesn't look as dopey with the cover on. So, um, but it's still kind of uh, an awkward looking helmet, uh, but it works. This helmet design uh, worked to the point where they decided to revise it and use it in a steel version. That is, both of these are still in use to today, um, but it's a interesting helmet. It's got a weird history, a weird design, and uh, it's made out of some weird materials. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. You subscribe if you like this sort of thing. I will leave a link that you could just copy paste right into your search bar out of the description. Uh, if you would like to make a contribution to the channel through Patreon, uh, as little as $1 a month gets you into the Discord. There's some really cool people there in the Discord. I'm on there a few times every day. We talk about everything under the sun from ammunition to, to weird food to, to the spiciest of memes, all that other good stuff. It's also the best way to get a hold of me if you want to show me something, work out a trade, buy something of mine. Uh, all of that stuff is uh, the easiest way to do that is to become a member of the Patreon and it all goes a long way to help support the channel. So you guys have gone a long ways to help me get parts to restore old firearms, to get uh, help complete versions of helmets like get covers for stuff, uh, and help me do get editing software to improve the quality of videos, which is in turn going to help the channel out quite a lot. If you can't support me on Patreon, that's totally fine. Leave a like, leave a comment, watch the video in its entirety. Um, you know, if you have an ad blocker, turn that off. Uh, if, if that's uh, not too much to ask, of course, I hate watching ads as well, so I don't blame you if you leave it on. Um, but watching the ads, liking the video, sharing the video, commenting on the video, all helps me in the algorithms, which is going to force YouTube to have to pay me more, which I still greatly appreciate uh, if you're willing to do that. If you can't actually support it monetarily, watching the whole video and watching, uh, liking, comment, and uh, subscribing, all that other good stuff helps just as much. So thank you so much for watching, you guys, and hopefully I will see all of you in the next video. Bye-bye now.